Trey Yinks joins us now from uh, Israel. Trey, where are you now? Yeah, hey, Brian. Right now I'm in Tel Aviv at Hostage Square. We've been talking with the family members of those who are still held inside Gaza. And still today, 74 days into the war, Tel Aviv's being targeted from Gaza. Air raid sirens sounding earlier here, sending hundreds of thousands of people to bomb shelters. Stunning, right? With with all the action there, with all the pressure, they're still able to send out rockets. Yeah. And it's really remarkable given how extensive the air campaign against Gaza has been. And the Israelis are operating in both the northern and southern part of the Gaza Strip. Yet still, Hamas and Islamic Jihad have a stockpile of rockets, and they're able to fire them toward major population centers. Now, Israel's missile defense system, the Iron Dome, is still intercepting most of that fire. Not a lot of it is slipping through at this point in the conflict. But as you talked about, there are other threats Israel is facing. It's not just Gaza anymore that they're worried about. It's other Iran-backed actors across the region. Right. Uh, I understand things are heating up with Hezbollah, but back to the hostages situation. What was uh, the fallout been from the three that were killed by the IDF over the weekend? So this has really changed the calculation for the Israelis, and it has upped the pressure internally. Yesterday, we were at the Kiria, Israel's version of the Pentagon, for that press conference between Yoav Gallant, the country's defense minister, and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. And they referenced this briefly, but, but it was conversations I had outside of that press conference that I found most illuminating. I spoke with a source, a longtime contact of mine, who works in the Kiria, and that source explained that this was really a shift in the mindset for the Israeli military and the government, because there's an understanding that Israel has to take a step back now and look at their policies and the level of, of training for the forces operating inside Gaza. And so there, there's an understanding as well that troops who are currently in Gaza, we're talking about thousands of Israeli soldiers, will now have to conduct themselves in a way that really ensures they are, are triple-checking targets and, and locations where they are firing mm -hmm. because of, of the criticism Israel is facing following the deaths of three hostages on Friday morning. One other thing to note about this, just outside of the Kiriyah yesterday, there were families of, of hostages who were calling for an immediate deal. They are willing uh, to, to put everything on the table in order to get their loved ones home. And that's simply not where the Israeli government stands right now on the issue. Right. CIA Director Burns is going back to Qatar. I heard the Mossad is sending a representative to Qatar to start getting hostage talks going. Have, you, have they looked yet at what went wrong there, the communication, uh, the fact that they came out without shirts on holding a white flag, I just saw some instant react analysis said, well, Hamas does a lot of that stuff. You know, they're, they're pretending to be doing one thing and they're actually doing another. Uh, so do you think there was a deception there? There was no expectation that Israelis would actually be in the area? The hostages would actually be loose? Yeah, it is. It is really the, the most tragic situation that could, could have happened for the Israelis because those forces had two objectives in Gaza. One was to look for the hostages and the other was to destroy Hamas leadership. Having been embedded with the Israeli military multiple times in Gaza since the war began, I can tell you these forces are afraid, and, and rightly so. They're facing an enemy that is fighting from an urban battle environment. They're popping out of tunnels, firing RPGs and anti-tank missiles at these troops and killing uh, more than 130 of them since this ground operation began. And so likely what took place was was a, a lack of discipline on the, the trigger for these, these forces. And the reality is, is that the Israelis have admitted the soldiers that killed the hostages did not follow protocol. Anytime inside Gaza when someone approaches with a white flag, and especially without a shirt on to show that they have no explosives underneath, they, they should be taken into custody and, and then reviewed to see who they are. And this simply didn't happen here. Now, why it didn't happen, we, we can speculate, but it, it likely had to do with, with forces operating either recklessly or carelessly, or they were simply afraid. They saw movement in, in Sajaya, mm -hmm. a very active neighborhood inside northern Gaza, and they fired. One of the stories yesterday said uh, a former hostage came out and recommended IDF don't go in the tunnels. Uh, it's going to be hell for you to go down there, and there might be some hostages down there, and there's no telling what they'll do. I don't think they have an option. Don't they have to go in the tunnels, or is the latest thing they're going to flood it with seawater? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Brian. And when we look at their options, they're very limited when we talk about southern Gaza. 
And southern Gaza is where it's believed not only the Hamas leadership is hiding in the tunnel network, but also many of the 129 Israelis that are still in Gaza, likely being held in those tunnels. And so they can't flood those tunnels, and they can't uh, use any sort of other means that, that have been discussed to destroy the tunnels with the Hamas leaders inside, because they may be killing their own civilians, their own soldiers. And it, it creates an incredibly complex and, and challenging part for this next phase of the conflict, because even if they're acting on intelligence, there's this question of do they enter the tunnels, do they not enter the tunnels, and, and if they do, could they be uh, booby trapped, and this has happened before. A number of Israeli soldiers have died during this war in booby trapped tunnels. They've entered, and Hamas ha- has blown up the tunnel on top of them. And and so the question really r- remains: How will they deal with, with Hamas leaders like Yahya Sinwar, the the leader of Hamas in Gaza, and others who are hiding in southern Gaza among the the hostages? And, and one thing we should remember here is that some of the hostages that were released, they reportedly met. Sinwar in the tunnels in the early days, an indication that these leaders knew if they were around the hostages, they were less likely to be targeted. Very interesting. Uh, so far, we understand that it's been reported that Israel has used 60 percent of the of the aerial bombing has been uh, dumb bombs and not the precision bombs or it's 40 percent have been dumb bombs, not the precision bombs. Do you think that number is correct? Yeah, I, I, I do. And it's it's quite controversial um, because when you look at, at Gaza, there will be a number of things that we're not discussing now that Israel will have to address later. Things like where the, the Palestinian people will live afterwards, the spread of disease inside Gaza with the amount of destruction and, and injuries to the civilian population. And these are things that, that Israel will face on their border and they will not just be criticized for, but but it will be a, a logistics challenge for them as they are the ones who are ultimately controlling the amount of aid that gets into Gaza. And they're the ones that, that have the Palestinian people as their neighbors. And so it's not an easy situation. Um, and it's an unpredictable situation because there is this, this question of what happens the day after the war is over. And that question still has not been answered by Israeli officials. It really, uh, it doesn't. Maybe they haven't figured it out. They're going for total victory. You know, I remember with bin Laden, they said it's a complex series of tunnels, look out, and they end up not being that. This is actually just as sophisticated as they thought. I could not believe some of the sizes of them. There were rail cars on the inside in some in some areas. You see all the tunnel-making equipment. Um, so this is, uh, and they said, what, 500 tunnels have been discovered so far? Do you get the sense that Netanyahu wants to go for a long time uh, on the ground? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. A- and I think the war will enter a new phase in the coming weeks. And a lot of that has to do with American pressure behind the scenes. And a lot of it has to do with the reality that you cannot win in an urban, complex battle environment simply by bombarding the entire area. Because there are civilians among the, this population. There are hostages among this population. And so they are reaching a point where the air superiority that, that Israel has in this situation and the ability to use their air force, it becomes more of a burden than a tool. And so this will be a very long campaign. According to Israel's defense minister, it will take several months to, to reach the objectives inside Gaza. But we are likely looking at a new phase that will include more tactical strikes. It will include more uh, missions based on specific intelligence for the forces that are still operating inside Gaza. And likely, if the Israelis listen to the international community, and and they behind the scenes, maybe not publicly are admitting this, but, but probably are planning for this contingency of what does come next, because there will have to be someone in charge of Gaza. There will have to be civilian infrastructure to support the more than 2 million people that live there. And with Israeli forces inside, they can't just play a role of security. They will have to coordinate some sort of of government control. And whether that goes to an actor like the United Nations or to a a foreign government like the Egyptians or the Qataris, that's still unknown at this point. So a couple of things. It looks like the Hezbollah side is heating up, and and according to reports, maybe there's a mobilization for an inevitable war while— Uh, Hamas winds down. Is that correct? Yeah, it is something that Israeli defense officials have talked about as inevitable with one caveat. They say that if 
diplomacy prevails, and they don't expect it to prevail, but if diplomacy prevails, it could avoid a limited or even wide-scale conflict with Hezbollah. There are Hezbollah militants operating on the border as we speak. They've fired dozens of anti-tank guided missiles into Israeli territory. They've killed civilians and soldiers alike, and they've launched more than 1,000 projectiles since this conflict began. They started just one day after the massacre in southern Israel, and from that day after, October 8th, they have been firing on a daily basis into northern Israel, and it, it raises the question of how long Israel will put up with it for. And because it's, it's not just the threat to the soldiers and civilians that remain in the north, it's the fact there are tens of thousands of Israelis that are internally displaced. The defense minister yesterday called them refugees in their own country, and, and he's right. They, are, they have been removed from their homes, and they can't return because of the threat of anti-tank guided missiles and rockets and missiles that have precision guided munition. And, and these are all real threats that if a larger war erupts, this, this will be considered the early days. This will be considered small compared to the arsenal that Hezbollah has. They have hundreds of thousands of rockets and missiles. They have precision guided munition that was smuggled in from Iran through places like Syria. And if a large scale war erupts, it will not be like the one with Gaza. There will be hundreds of casualties, according to assessments, and it will be something that the United States could play a role in, in the response. Now, yesterday, Secretary Austin was asked about this, and he basically just sent the message of deterrence to Hezbollah, saying that he would recommend they do not do that. And, and that has been the American position. But this is a, a situation that is quickly running out of time, and, and there is a question about when Israel will strike offensively. Trey Yanks, great work. Always appreciate the insight and analysis as well as the reporting uh, from uh, from Israel. Thanks, Trey. Thank you. You got it. Stay safe. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.